After Capcom's enormously successful launch of Street Fighter 2 back in 1991, the company released update after update after update, and it seemed like Street Fighter 2 mania would just never end. Capcom were on top of the world, and as they had no intentions of slowing down, they started to work on games involving licensed properties like the X-Men to widen their market share even more. A few years after the release of Street Fighter 2, however, came a brand new title in the series, Street Fighter Alpha. This game was the birth of a brand new sub-series within the larger Street Fighter franchise, and with its younger character roster and the anime-inspired art style, this game was a prequel set before the events of Street Fighter 2. Later on in the 90s, Capcom released two sequels, Street Fighter Alpha 2 and Street Fighter Alpha 3. These games have all received various ports to home consoles and portable devices, but for this video, I'll specifically be focusing on the arcade versions. It's been over two decades since the last game in the series was released, and as Capcom has shown no intention of developing a potential Street Fighter Alpha 4, I wanted to go back to all three Alpha games and analyze them to figure out why they're so beloved. From die-hard fighting game competitors to button-mashing casual players, people from all skill levels can find something fun about these games, and I have a lot of really good memories of playing games like Alpha 2 in the arcade as a kid. I'll also be using Street Fighter Alpha and Oral History on Polygon as one of my sources, so please check this piece out if you'd like even more details about these games. Without further ado, let's begin properly by going way back to the very beginning of the Alpha series. Street Fighter 2 famously ran on the CPS2 board, Capcom's flagship arcade technology at the time, and as times progressed, many arcades simply weren't using their older CPS1 boards anymore. According to Street Fighter Alpha designer Noritaka Funamizu, Capcom's plan was that if arcade operators bought a CPS2 board, Capcom would buy back their leftover CPS1 boards. This was a successful venture, but over time, the amount of CPS1 boards that Capcom had regained was getting out of hand. Funamizu recalls that there was a warehouse with all of the CPS1 boards that Capcom had bought back, and it was quickly filling up. Seriously, Capcom had so many of their older boards that their mentality went from, it won't be too bad if we get some of these back, to, we need to get rid of all of these now as soon as possible. When it came time to make a new Street Fighter game specifically, Capcom staff thought that the skill gap between casual players and the die-hard crowd was too large, and they wanted to make a new game that could even up the playing field. At the same time, Capcom artist Akira Yasuda created a new design team within the company, and new highest Kiyu Nishimura and Bengus joined this group. Funamizu explains that back then, Bengus was tasked by a games magazine to draw Street Fighter 1 characters in his own unique style, and although I can't find what these drawings look like, Funamizu said that these drawings were really good. This sparked interest towards Street Fighter 1 within Capcom, and after programmer Seiji Okada heard about this, he pushed Finamuzu to create a new Street Fighter game with these old characters. Capcom staff also realized that if they could release a version of this game running on the CPS1 board as well, then they could kill two birds with one stone. There were two problems, however. Most of the game's developers were inexperienced, and they only had three months to make the whole game. Flying over to America now, former Capcom staff member Chris Kramer mentioned that during Street Fighter Mania in the 90s, worries about brand oversaturation were slowly taking over Capcom USA, and once they heard about this new game, they thought to themselves, do we really need a new Street Fighter game so soon? Once they saw that brand new anime-inspired art style and inclusion of some Street Fighter 1 characters, their fears were laid to rest as they realized that for the first time in what felt like eons, Capcom wasn't doing yet another Street Fighter 2 update. As for Alpha's development team, it did have some experienced staff members like Funamizu, but it also had a certain new hire whose name is Hideaki Itsuno. Whether you know this guy or not, you've probably played one of his games before. Itsuno would always come into work early to play the King of Fighters 94 on his Neo Geo system, and as he was playing one day, Funamizu walked into the room and asked him if he wanted to be the planner on the new Street Fighter game. This took Itsuno by surprise, and I see why. Itsuno was relatively inexperienced at the time, and he had only worked on one game beforehand, 1994's Quiz and Dragons Capcom Quiz Game. Funamizu has since admitted that he honestly can't remember working with Itsuno on the game, but it's definitely not the other way around. Itsuno states that while he was really freaked out at first, he couldn't say no, as the opportunity to work on such a big game didn't come by his way every day. Itsuno also realized that in order to make the game successful, he had to study the previous Street Fighter games, and not just by going to the arcade and playing them a couple times. As a result of being a Capcom staff member, he was allowed to view older games' frame data and hitboxes to understand why their moves felt so good to use, and his intention was to take all the knowledge he gained and put it into Street Fighter Alpha. Speaking of Street Fighter Alpha, the name that is, I personally think it's a really cool name, but you'll know that in Japan, the game is called Street Fighter Zero. The original plan was to call this game Street Fighter Classic, but the name was quickly changed to Zero, with Capcom's intentions being to call the game Street Fighter Zero in every country. Capcom USA then told Capcom Japan that the word Zero would sound negative to a Western audience, and that if this game was meant to represent a new beginning for the series, then the word Alpha, after the first letter of the Greek alphabet, would work better. Capcom Japan really liked the name Street Fighter Alpha, and the rest is history. 
The game was also designed with the complete opposite of the arcade division's mindset, as while they normally make games that would be, quote, impossible to port to home consoles due to them running on advanced arcade technology, the CPS-1 board's age meant that Street Fighter Alpha could easily be ported to home consoles at the time, like the PlayStation. In the beginning, the developers had the Super Nintendo in mind for home ports, but the higher-ups at Capcom wanted the game to release for Sony's new 3D system. Alpha's three-month deadline was also deemed as being impossible, so the developers were granted more time to work on the game, and they finished the whole thing in six months, which is still pretty impressive. Before we move on to the next part, I feel like I need to talk about one character in particular though, Dan Hibiki. It's reported that in an issue of Capcom USA's newsletter, a comic strip of Ryu and SNK's very own Kyo fought it out, with Ryu winning the battle, and then saying, It took all my strength and power, but I finally defeated him. Funny enough, the only move he couldn't match was something original. Damn. After the release of Street Fighter 1, many of that game's staff members had left Capcom and joined SNK. There was a feeling that SNK had stolen away a lot of Capcom talent in that era, and I think there was some bitterness there because a good chunk of the Street Fighter team had gone over to SNK for various reasons, and so Dan was 100% their opinion of what SNK fighters were versus Capcom fighters at that time. Now that we have an understanding of how and why Street Fighter Alpha was made, let's jump into its gameplay. Despite being made with new players in mind, Street Fighter Alpha contains the classic six-button layout made famous by Street Fighter 2. There are three punches and three kicks of varying strengths, and a general rule of thumb is that the stronger the button, the slower it will be, too. Special moves are performed with motion inputs accompanied by button presses, and they do feel quite nice and responsive. In terms of general game feel, it reminds me a lot of the other games in the series that came before it. While it doesn't have the lightning speed of a game like Super Turbo, Street Fighter Alpha is definitely faster than the older revisions of Street Fighter 2, and its snappy pace is really enjoyable. Before we get into the general game mechanics, I'd like to touch on the new characters for a bit. Charlie, Dan, Guy, Rose, and Sodom are the game's newcomers, and while characters like Birdie and Adon are known for their appearances in Street Fighter Alpha, they actually originated in Street Fighter 1, albeit in non-playable forms. All of the newcomers look and feel very different in terms of gameplay, and some of them, like Charlie for example, have stories that relate back to characters from Street Fighter 2. Some of these characters get destroyed by the returning characters in terms of viability, but other characters like Guy and Rose for example can definitely keep up with the other high tiers, watch with their unique fighting styles. A brand new addition to the game are chain combos, and these have been taken from Darkstalkers. When you're doing a normal attack, you can interrupt it with another attack of equal or higher strength, although this system isn't quite as fluid as the magic series found in something like Marvel vs. Capcom. Instead of pressing the buttons in a very quick rhythm like in those games, you have to consciously time your next attack here. And while the timing can feel a bit weird when you return to this game years later, it's crucial to get used to the system, because it allows you to do consistent damage for relatively low execution. Another mechanic that was brought over from another game is the super meter. Much like in Super Turbo, doing special moves builds the meter, and when it's full, you can perform a super. However, the meter in Alpha has been expanded upon, because characters now have multiple supers, and there are now three levels of supers. If I want to do Ken's level 1 Shinryuken, for example, I can do the motion input but only press one kick button, but if I want to do the level 2 super, I have to do the motion but with two kick buttons. Basically, the more buttons you input, the higher the super level will be. Higher supers can do huge damage, but if they miss or are blocked, then not only have you just wasted a lot of meter, but you'll also be open for a punish. More new features include the ability to block certain moves in the air, and the ability to roll on the ground after a knockdown. If you input a backwards DP motion and then punch upon hitting the ground, you roll out of a hard knockdown, and I believe that this works for every type of knockdown in the game, even throws. This system means that even if you get hit by a big combo, you can almost immediately get up and continue the fight, and it's part of why the game's pacing has such an energetic feel to it. The final new mechanic is the alpha counter. With one bar of meter, input this weird quarter circle down motion and press punch while in block stun to get the enemy away from you. This is an iconic defensive technique that does some decent damage if you manage to land it, so it's very important to utilize these in a real match. In terms of gameplay, speaking overall, Street Fighter Alpha is a pretty feature-rich game, and while it does lack crazy custom combos and the ism select mechanics found in future games, it's hard to fault the gameplay here because of how fundamentally solid it is. After its release in June of 1995, Street Fighter Alpha, thankfully for Capcom, was a smash hit. During my research, I stumbled across an issue of a Japanese game magazine called Gamist, and according to this webpage that transcribes what was in Volume 162, Street Fighter Alpha was the third best received fighting game and the second most profitable fighting game that year. Capcom even won their favorite manufacturer award for Alpha, so it shows that in their native Japan, the game was a crazy success. I'm unable to find a definitive report covering how much money the game made exactly, but I'm pretty sure that it made a lot of money. In terms of overseas reception, it's hard to find information about the arcade version specifically, as most of the game's coverage is about the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn ports, but I did find that on pages 72 and 73 of Computer and Video Games Magazine's July 1995 issue, they scored the game a 92 out of 100, and they said that, If this were to be the last of the Street Fighter titles, this is a splendid way to bow out, which is a very bold claim. 
Another outlet, Electronic Gaming Monthly, even gave the game a near-perfect score in their February 1996 issue, so it shows that reviewers in general loved the game. Capcom took a chance on a young team that wanted to incorporate new characters and artwork into their beloved Street Fighter series, and this risk paid off, big time. Much like any game that succeeds, a sequel was commissioned almost instantly, and it turned out to be one of the best Street Fighter games ever made. First released in arcades in 1996, Street Fighter Alpha 2 is arguably the golden child of the series, and hell, there's even an anime movie that takes heavy inspiration which I used to love as a kid. But anyway, look, we'll get into the game's mechanics and reception later on. For now, let's focus on its background information. As a disclaimer, finding detailed information about Alpha 2's development is a lot more challenging than it was for Alpha 1, what with the game's creation not being very well documented, but I did my best to find some interesting information. According to page 17 of Next Generation Magazine's 17th issue, Alpha 2 was first announced at the 1996 AOU show in Tokyo, which was a video game trade show where companies would show off new games and hardware. I can't find any footage of what the show floor looked like due to how long ago this event was, but I still thought I'd bring it up. There isn't much information given about the game in this magazine, but the writer does mention that it contains many new changes that justifies the game being a numbered sequel, so I can only imagine that some of the new characters and gameplay features were demonstrated at the event. I was also able to find an issue of Sega Saturn magazine that contains four very detailed pages covering the game a few months after it launched. This piece contains an interview with Shinji Mikami, the dude behind games like Mega Man and Dead Rising. There's a lot of information in this interview, but in terms of what's important for this video, the interviewer asked why chaining normals together in Alpha 2 is harder than the first game, and Mikami replied, It wasn't our intention for people to have this impression. The reason may be because the damage levels for Alpha and Alpha 2 are different. When we were trying to get the balance of Alpha 2 right, we only concentrated on Alpha 2. We don't really have to get the same actual damage as Alpha. In Alpha 2, some new characters were introduced, so in order to maintain the game balance, we had to increase the damage for the normal hits. In addition, this time for Alpha 2, we wanted to focus on the importance of the normal hits and not just the specials. That last part sticks out to me, as it seems that Capcom wanted to create a game that was more focused on normals and footsies, rather than getting one lucky hit and immediately having a massive life lead. Another aspect of the game's development that I find interesting involves one of the new characters, the fan favorite Sakura. I mentioned this in my Darkstalkers video, but at the time in Japan, the Street Fighter series was seen as having a hard edge to it that appealed to a lot of young men, but when Sakura was introduced, fans were outraged and they accused Capcom of trying to appeal to a crowd of otakus. Thankfully, Sakura did stick around for future games in the series, and she even made appearances in multiple Marvel vs. Capcom games and she's definitely a fan favorite. As for the game's hardware, Alpha 2 runs on the CPS2 board without a CPS1 revision being manufactured. I couldn't find a reason for this that explains it specifically, but I personally suspect that in 1996, the CPS1 was considered to be too old to justify creating a new game for it, so Capcom went all in on the CPS2 for Alpha 2. In terms of gameplay, most of Alpha 1's mechanics return, although chain combos have been made harder to do. Instead of being a completely universal mechanic, different characters have different chain timings now, and the Super Combo Wiki website reports that Guy and Gen have easy chains for example. The expanded Super Meter, Air Blocking, Alpha Counters, and Tech Rolling all make a return, and before we get into the new stuff, I will say that instead of only having one Alpha Counter, every character now has two. Ken, for example, has an amazing Kick Alpha Counter, so you won't be using this Punch one very often. This means that figuring out which of your character's Alpha Counters works best in certain situations is part of the game's strategy, and I quite like it. The biggest new addition to Alpha 2, however, is what's known as a custom combo. With at least one bar of meter, press either two punches and a kick, or two kicks and a punch to activate this mode. Custom combos let you cancel moves into other moves, so if I wanted to keep throwing fireballs like this for big chip damage, I can do just that. If the opponent isn't blocking when I activate a custom combo, they will be pulled towards me, allowing me to hit them with pretty much anything I want. Having to choose between spending meter on a custom combo or a super is important, and I personally love this part of the game's strategy. There's an ocean's worth of tech and community findings about this mechanic, and I simply don't have the time to include all of it in this video, but if you're interested in learning more, please check out Super Combo Wiki for an extensive write-up on custom combos. Much like Alpha 1, Alpha 2 still has a very snappy pace, and it's possible for small combos to do some big damage. Character walk speeds and jump arcs are different between the cast, but every character still feels responsive and fluid. Character diversity is also one of this game's strengths, as there are Shotos, Grapplers, Zoners, Wrecker characters, Charge characters, and even Stance characters all found within Alpha 2. Speaking overall, the gameplay in Alpha 2 definitely feels a lot more refined than the gameplay in Alpha 1. Alpha 2 feels tighter and more fluid than the first game, and as a result, the game is a lot more enjoyable. Much like the first game, Alpha 2 was also an instant hit, with Japanese outlet Game Machine reporting that the game was the most profitable arcade game of April 1995. It also won Gamus 1996 Game of the Year award, as well as the award for Best Fighting Game. If you couldn't tell already, the Japanese crowd loved Alpha 2, and they thought that it was a definite improvement over the first game. 
In the West, Alpha 2 was just as beloved, and if you ask any Street Fighter fan which one is their favorite, there's a good chance they'll say Alpha 2. I couldn't find any definitive information about American arcade data, but I did find reviews for the game's PlayStation, Saturn, and Super Nintendo ports. This one is perhaps the most interesting port, because it's such an advanced game to the point where the SNES can struggle to run it at times. As for how the game's new mechanics were received, I found a quote from page 129 of Next Generation Magazine's 18th issue, and they said that custom combos were, an unprecedented, new, and complex innovation in Street Fighter gameplay. Another thing to keep in mind is that during this time in the 90s, 2D fighting games were seen as being technologically inferior to their 3D cousins, but despite this, people also thought that Alpha 2 was still just as good, if not better, than most 3D fighting games on the market. The PlayStation and the Saturn version succeeded, with the Saturn version specifically selling over 400,000 copies in Japan alone. With two successful Alpha titles under their belt, they put their head down and they went to work on yet another game in this series. To be honest, we've sort of hit a roadblock here, because finding information about Alpha 3's development is even harder than Alpha 2, but I was able to find some old game magazines and articles that give us insight into Alpha 3's public perception before the game was released. Alpha 3 made an appearance at E3 1999, and on page 32 of Gamers Republic magazine, they wrote that Alpha 3 was, quote, decidedly PlayStation looking, and they included a screenshot of the game. We can see Vism Curran fighting Zism Adon, and immediately we can tell that Zism is green instead of being red like in the final game. While not specifically related to the game's development, I did come across this picture of cosplayers Capcom hired to help promote the game at a game show in 1998. And while some of them, like Sakura and Sodom, look really good and authentic, Gen and Birdie are hilarious, and their costumes are super silly, but in a good way. While browsing through the Sega Retro website, which was a big help for this video by the way, I found that Noritaka Funamizu and Yoshiki Okamoto were the game's producers, and according to this chart on the site, a total of over 100 people worked on the game, including voice actors. With the previous two games being massive successes, it makes sense that Capcom would have thrown a lot of resources into Alpha 3. By this time, Street Fighter 3 New Generation and Second Impact had been released, and they weren't exactly bestsellers to put it lightly. Trying to make a more traditional Street Fighter game with all of the classic characters was a smart idea, and so much talent and hard work would have gone into Alpha 3's creation. I wish I could find more concrete information about this game's development, and even though I searched high and low on the internet for a developer interview or retrospective, I was unable to find anything like this. However, I was able to find an interview with the game's announcer, Greg Irwin. Alpha 3 has a super iconic announcer, and thanks to some of the Australian Alpha 3 guys, they were able to help shed some light into Greg's involvement with the game. According to Greg, he used to host a radio show on FM Yokohama called Amusement Hotline, and this introduced him to other voice actors located in Japan. After working here, he thought about a potential career in voice acting, but there weren't that many voice agencies in Japan who were willing to hire foreigners. After making a demo tape with some recordings, he was slowly but surely being noticed by Japanese recording agencies, which is how he gained the attention of Capcom. Greg recalled that the voice recordings were done in a very professional recording studio, and my favorite quote of his has to be, you get a huge thing of water and you literally scream your head off. Greg stated that Capcom had written the script in advance, and that due to the language barrier, some words would often be spelt incorrectly or sentences wouldn't make a whole lot of sense at times, so we also had to let them know if a certain phrase didn't translate into English very well. Luckily, the voice lines heard in the final game turned out fantastic, and if you ask me, so did the gameplay. The basics of Alpha 2's gameplay return to Alpha 3, so Alpha counters, teching, and the general control scheme make an appearance here. However, the biggest new addition is the ism system. When you pick your character, you're given the option of either A-ism, V-ism, or X-ism. These isms all function very differently, and they can dramatically change how you see the game's meta. By the way, this helpful chart from the Super Combo Wiki website does a good job of explaining all the differences, so I'm getting my information from here. For starters, Xism gives you a longer guard bar and a damage buff, but you also take more damage, you can't air block, you can't ground tech, you can't alpha counter, and you only have one level 3 super. Having less defensive options and only one super makes it feel like you're playing an older Street Fighter game, and CPS 1 chains also play into this. This is an Xism specific mechanic that lets any chain into a light kick also chain into a heavy punch, and the example Super Combo Wiki provides is Julie. Starting a combo with a light and then trying to combo into this move will usually never work, but you can get around this if you use a CPS 1 chain. The combos that some characters can do in this ism are nuts, and I was blown away by seeing a Sakura player use it in one of my netplay tournaments for the game. Moving on to A-ism now, this lets you block in the air and perform both ground and air teching, as well as giving you 3 bars of meter. Characters also have standard amounts of damage and defensive stats, and the guard bars are different for every character in this ism. Your meter also builds faster in this mode when compared to Xism, and you can use it to perform alpha counters. This is sort of like Street Fighter Alpha 1, as while you don't get access to custom combos, the three bars of meter help you to play a more, I guess, typical style of Street Fighter. It's very reliable. 
Finally, Vism lets you use custom combos. You do less damage overall, and you lack access to traditional supers in this ism, but some of the combos you can do are straight up war crimes. Ryu, for example, has an infinite in Vism, so it shows that even characters who are seen as being very basic and fundamentally sound can do some really crazy stuff. Not having access to regular supers and doing less damage overall can make Vism tricky for newcomers, but experienced players all around the world have shown that pretty much every character can do really insane things in Vism. The ism system overall is obviously Alpha 3's primary gameplay hook, and I personally love it. This system provides you with so much freedom when determining how you wish to play the game, as even the same character can function differently when using different isms. I personally love using A-ism Zangief, but seeing some of the stuff that he can do in V-ism tempts me to try him out. Alpha 3, to me at least, is quite possibly the most anime Street Fighter game. It has a very quick pace, counter hits are accentuated by a big screen flash, big damage combos can happen often, and every character feels extremely unique and diverse to play. Much like Alpha 1 and 2, Alpha 3 was also an immediate hit, with it being very financially successful for Capcom. As for how it was received overseas, Westerners once again love the brand new Alpha game, and the PS1 port for example currently has a 93 on Metacritic. The gameplay, brand new mechanics, and the audio were all praised, although some thought that the sprite art looked a bit dated when compared to 3D fighting games at the time, which is a bit ironic nowadays, but it does show that Alpha 3 was once again hit by the 3D looks better than 2D mentality that was very prevalent at the time. According to Capcom's very own website, Alpha 3 on PS1 sold a million copies, and when you factor in all the other versions of the game, it would have sold even more. There are lots and lots of versions of Alpha 3, with the most recent entry being the home port of Alpha 3 Upper that's part of the upcoming Capcom Fighting Collection 2, so now it'll be even easier to play this game offline on official hardware. As a side note, remember Super Turbo HD Remix? During my research, I found an Event Hubs article that claims originally the plan was to do a HD remake of Alpha 3. HD Remix's lead designer David Serlin pushed for Super Turbo, but Capcom wanted Alpha 3 instead. Super Turbo was eventually chosen because the smaller amount of characters and mechanics would mean less development time was needed to finish the game, but having a HD remix of Alpha 3 would also be pretty cool. If you're familiar with Capcom's former fighting game business model, you'll know that they had a bunch of games all releasing around the same time, and this also included games in the same series releasing one after the other. With arcades declining popularity within the mainstream during the early 2000s, to Capcom now focusing on one main fighting game at a time, it makes sense why they didn't continue the Alpha series. From a small development team with a vision to incorporate a brand new art style and gameplay system into the Street Fighter series, to a large team who had the budget and the skills necessary to throw as many characters in the game as they wanted to for the final entry, there's a lot to love about not just the series as a whole, but also each individual game. Although Alpha 2 is the most popular one competitively, the other games still have their fans, and you can find tons of really good Alpha 3 footage from Japan online if you're interested. Classic characters like Rose, Rainbow Mika, Cody, Gen, and Sakura all made their playable debuts in the Alpha games, so this series definitely has a long-lasting legacy. If you're interested in trying these games out casually, I'd highly recommend playing Alpha 3 Max on the PSP. This version has the most amount of content, and it's fantastic to kill time with as a result. So much love and passion went into these games, and it's immediately obvious just by playing it. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.